All right, what's up? How's it going? Hello, hello, Bitbird family. How are you doing? Um, first things first, let me know if you can hear me okay. I had to switch to <laughs> my gaming headset because I'm having some issues with my audio interface, of course, so I couldn't use my usual mic setup. Um, yeah. <laughs> Apologies for, for the cat ears. Actually, I'm not going to apologize for that. They're fun. Um, but yeah, let me know if you can hear me all right. I will try to... Oh, perfect. I'm going to try to keep an eye on the chat as we go here as well and um, answer any questions as we go along. Um, but yeah, first of all, just wanted to say uh, thank you all for, for hanging out with me today. Thank you so much, Bitbird, for having me and for putting on this whole series in the first place. I just think it's so amazing. Um, such, a, such a cool opportunity to, uh, to connect with fellow artists. So thank you, first things first. Um, if you don't already know me, uh, my name is Dot. It's very nice to meet you. I am a artist and producer and audio engineer, um, currently based in LA as well as Idaho kind of go back and forth when I can. Um, I've been working in the music industry for about 10 years now, um, studying music my whole life. Um, also run a record label slash production company called Unspeakable Records. I've been doing that for a number of years. I um, was also a part of a collective called Team Supreme. Some of you may have been familiar with um, us during like more of the SoundCloud era of music. Um, so I got a lot of my uh, start just with making music with those guys and, and have been doing that ever since. So I'm really excited to share with you today some of the strategies that I have just picked up along the way. Um, <laughs> what's up, what's up? Just trying to say hello to the people in the chat who's here. What's up, Miles? What's up, Matthew? Hi, Wind. What's good? How are you all? Let me know where you're tuning in from. I'd love to just catch a vibe from <laughs> wherever you are in the world. Um, we've also got Pluto, my dog, hanging out here in the background. He might come say hi a little bit later. Anyways, intros aside, um, I am very excited for this particular class because um, this, this area that I want to cover here for the next, um, we'll probably go for maybe 45 minutes or so or an hour, we'll see how long we end up rambling on and what sort of questions pop up, but um, this is something that I feel is so needed um, amongst creative communities. I mean, if you look at any sort of traditional, like, music school curriculum, music education curriculum, um, or even just search anything about music production like on YouTube or wherever, you'll find so many tutorials that are all tech focused or theory focused, which is of course invaluable. We need these skills, we need these tools, we need these assets, but there's very little information out there, although I think it's getting better um, in recent years, but traditionally there hasn't been as much info out there on how artists can best, you know, structure their time and structure their careers or their creative lives so that it is conducive to their mental health and longevity. You know, this whole music making experience is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and a lot of the tools and, and resources that we have now to, to supposedly help us with the creative process and help us especially with the sharing process like streaming pl platforms, etc. cetera, um, a lot of them can also cause some hiccups <laughs> with, with our process or you know, add some, some strain or some challenges or um, some negativity to, to all of that. And so for what I wanna share today, um, it's my hope that we can just kind of bring more awareness into our process of not only creating music, but how we're sharing it, figure out how we can set up workflows that best suit um, our 
lifestyles, our schedules that best suit the way that we think, the way that we relate to our, our music and connect with others. You know, this is never going to be like a one size fits all thing. Um, and I also just want to look at a few uh, like more practical exercises that we can use to just make sure we're like maintaining our, our mental health and wellness on a daily basis as we go about um, creating. So yeah, sorry, just catching up on the chat. What's up? Oh, Denver. Oh, Wales. What's up? International squad. Um, what's up? What's up, Hunter? <laughs> Um, awesome. All right. So before I launch into this whole spiel, though, I do just want to make a disclaimer. Um, you know, I, I myself am an, am an artist. I am not a neuroscientist. I am not a clinical therapist. Um, so all of the information that I'm going to present for you now is for for fun. <laughs> it is for recreational use only. This is not any type of official medical advice um, or anything like that. This is just something that personally I have spent like a, about 15 years or so researching, not just from like a Western science perspective, but also various um, Eastern practices and, um, and looking at it from more of a spiritual lens as well. So it's something that I'm deeply passionate about. However, I am not giving anyone medical advice. Just wanted to lay that out there. Um, I am speaking from my own personal experience, from my own personal research, from, from my friend's experience as well uh, on their journeys in making music. Um, so just wanted to lay that out there. Um, all right, cool. So let me pull up my notes really quick and we can jump into this. Um, of course, there's a car alarm going on outside that's driving me crazy. <laughs> Hopefully that's not coming in super hot on the mic. Um, right, so as I was saying before, we've got so many schools and tutorial series and institutions that are all centered, centered around the technical side of things. Like you can find a million tutorials on how to make the perfect like 808 kick or find all these tips on mixing, but there aren't as many resources for time management, resources for wellness and sustainability for artists and, and like ways that we can um, like integrate this into our practice. Oh my goodness, this car alarm is driving me insane. <laughs> I'm so sorry y'all. Um, I'm going to try to just power through it here. So all that to say, one of the biggest challenges that I see currently among like creative communities and artists who, especially those who like share their work on the internet, is that the tools that we have designed to like hypothetically help or support our careers, like streaming platforms, social media, um, all of these things can be good in some ways, but in a lot of cases they are they're doing some harm to the creative process. So there's actually, um, oh good, there's no background noise, that's good to hear. All right, because it's very loud over here and it's impossible to hear myself think. I love that I'm doing a talk on like focus and mental wellness and like dealing with this right now. <laughs> Thank you universe for that little joke. Okay, so there's this pretty, um, pretty famous or well-known study that came out of Stanford a few years ago um, that was done in a nursery school. And basically what happened was they looked at kids who particularly like to draw during their recess time, during their free time. I mean, well, like pretty much all of nursery school at that age is like recess. But they looked at these kids who, who loved to draw, who had who gravitated towards drawing frequently. And so they did this study where they started giving gold stars um, to the kids who were drawing and would put like a little star on their work, you know, when they were done. Um, and then eventually they stopped, in this, in, this, uh, in this study, they stopped giving the stars. And when they stopped giving those external rewards, the kids actually stopped drawing. They had associated this good feeling of drawing with the external rewards. And when those external rewards stopped, the kids stopped drawing. So why am I bringing this up? Um, for me, and I know a lot of people might feel this way as well, 
um, as artists, like we have to be very, very cautious about how much of our internal dopamine we attach to external rewards, meaning maybe like streaming numbers. So a common like trajectory that I see among artists is, you know, they get into music, we get into music because it's amazing, because we love it, or we get into any art form, medium, whatever, um, because we love it. We love, we just love this joy of, of creating, of discovering new things, new sounds, new visuals, experimenting. Um, and then at some point, maybe we put something on SoundCloud uh, because we, we love it so much, and we love it, we wanna share it, we start putting things on SoundCloud, um, and then we're getting this feedback this, these external rewards may be in the form of like streaming numbers or comments. And then what happens if you put something up, let's say you've been doing this for a bit, you put something up that like doesn't perform as well as previous work. Um, for a lot of us, that can be extremely <laughs> demotivating or defeating. And all of a sudden there's like this whole other motivating factor that's been introduced into our process um, that like when it's not hitting, it really can throw us for a loop creatively. So a lot of the work that I do, um, like with the artists that I coach or have produced for in the past is try to restructure their process so that it's more centered around internal rewards again, instead of these external ones. Um, easier said than done, of course. Uh, I actually want to pull up a quick video. Um, this is a podcast interview with um, Dr. Andrew Huberman, who is also a neuroscientist based out of, I believe he's out of Stanford. Yes. All right, let me get this pulled up for y'all because I wanted to play this little clip where he explains this um, a bit more clearly than I possibly could. So let me get this switched over. Let's see if I set up these layouts correctly. Look at that, beautiful. All right, let's hit play on this for a second. Absolutely. There, there's an interesting process that, um, that occurs when people start to realize that rewards are all internal. And what they start to do is they start linking this duration path outcome thing to their internal rewards. And so to put this simply, one of the most powerful things that any person can do is to learn to control this idea of duration, path, and outcome and attach an internal sense of reward, just that you're doing well, to reward yourself mentally, just say, I'm doing well, I'm actually on the right path. To do that inside of the demands that come from the external world, the more often that we can self-reward some aspect of the process, provided it's in the right direction of what we're trying to achieve, the more energy we're right. going to have for that, the more focus we're going to have for that. And remember, the, nor the reason I say energy, I don't throw that around loosely, is that l limiting amount of noradrenaline is constantly being kept at bay. You're literally buffering the quit response. And so when people start realizing that if they set the goals inside of the larger goal and self-reward each one of those, they essentially have an infinite amount of energy to pursue those goals. They have an infinite amount of focus to pursue those yeah. goals. You see this most uh, in the special operations community and people that are selected essentially for this process. So one of the things that's been intriguing to me, I have some friends from the SEAL teams and I don't begin to you know, really understand the, the real work that they do deployed because I've never done that kind of work. But I've always been intrigued by the selection process, the so-called BUDS process, right? Because carrying logs and getting in cold water and all that, that's not really how the work is. That's yeah. really not what the work is about. So the selection process is interesting because everyone shows up fit, motivated, and convinced that they're not going to quit. I mean, I think like there might be a couple people that just right. show up to show up, but everybody is absolutely convinced. And then a very small subset of them make it through. And I'd be willing to bet that the ones that make it through, of course, they're gritty and resilient, but they all are essentially. Right? So that's necessary but not sufficient, obviously. Otherwise, they, everyone would make it through. The people that make it through somehow are able to tap into a process. Maybe it's a reward process. Maybe it's through self-punishment. Maybe it's through self-reward um, in the positive sense. But they're able to control something inside an environment that is not controlled by them. It's controlled by the, by the instructors. And I, I've always been struck by the fact that in order to, to not 
in order to get through, you just have to not quit. Remember, people aren't being deselected. They're not saying, get out of here. You're not good enough. You're not. People are deciding that for themselves. Right. And so it's interesting because it brings about a real world experiment of people who are quitting. And I believe they're quitting because they can't manage these neurotransmitters. And the people, and when I say manage, I think that the people that get through, knowing some of these people quite well, had an internal process by which they could reward themselves for doing something that might've just looked trivial to everybody else, but it gave them more gas, more right. energy, right? Right. And what's interesting is the process, the, the kind of unconscious genius of, of the Bud's process is that they've picked two sensory events that are across the board challenging for everyone. Okay, we could keep listening to this for so long. There's a lot of really good information in this particular episode. I think this is on the Rich Roll podcast. Yeah. Uh, so if you, you know, want to learn more from these guys, uh, just wanted to cite that source. Let me switch my view back. Uh, but I just think this is uh, fascinating. I mean, obviously, we're not in this context talking about... Um, how to get into the seals. <laughs> We're talking about music, but I see so many parallels with like, you know, let's say major music artists um, who have become successful by however many ways you want to define that. It's, it's, you know, the ones who make it, again, it's, it's make it to a certain level that you might be reaching for um, if that's even in your sphere of goals. Um, you know, there's there's no one like telling people to, to get out. It's like the ones who persevere, who just don't quit, who just keep going. Um, and most importantly, the ones who have this internal source of motivation um, tend to, if not go the farthest by some external, you know, system of evaluation. Um, for me, I, I find those people just honestly make the best music, um, at least the music that, that resonates the most with me, um, simply because they're able to spend, you know, the, the, the longest amount of time on it and stick with it. So um, really just kind of interesting stuff there. Um, let me just switch my view back. So all of this to say, how can we start to rewire ourselves uh, or reassociate <laughs> our, our creative practices with these internal rewards again and really make sure that's a clear motivating factor and it's not just we're doing it for the streams or we're doing it for the follows or the money or... Uh, you know, any of these other external things. Um, how do we do that? Uh, so I want to throw a ton of different practices at you <laughs> for you to try. Um, these are not all things that you necessarily have to do today or right now. Um, just kind of pick and choose, see what resonates right now, maybe save the rest for a rainy day. Um, but I just want to share, honestly, as much information as I possibly can with you over the next few minutes um, for you to try on your own time, see what exercises and what practices work for you and, and what doesn't, you can just let it go. Um, yeah, I, this is, this is, a lot of this information is something that, you know, I, I work with artists on over the course of like three months to a year. So again, this is very much the like abbreviated version, like here's a bunch of things to try out, see what's helpful and, and, uh, kind of go from there. It's like, we're just going to throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. Um, so the, the number one thing that I try to establish, not just, you know, for my own music, but for, you know, for other artists that I'm working with, is, is the importance of having a very consistent daily practice and the ability to track it. Um, so I know as artists, there, there's like also this narrative that you know, you're, you're supposed to like wait for inspiration to strike before you start creating. And, you know, we can sometimes get into these writer's blocks or these creative ruts. I um, mean, you know, I've definitely been there, but it's like we're, a, lo a lot of us kind of find ourselves 
sitting here waiting for inspiration to strike before we begin working. Um, but the way to, I, I feel, draw more inspiration to yourself is to show up consistently and create something, even if like right when you sit down, maybe you're not totally feeling it. Um, because that could change as soon as you start. You never know what could happen in a session. You know, you might begin something feeling one way and then finish the session feeling a complete other type of way. There's so much that can happen, but a lot of times we don't even allow ourselves the opportunities to discover that because we just don't even sit down in the first place. We kind of let that resistance um, slow us down. So again, if you can establish a really like super easy to hit goal, like let's just say your goal is 15 minutes per day or 10 minutes per day, even if you just open up Ableton or open up your DAW or whatever it is that you're using to work or pick up your instrument and just touch it for a second, like that could count. Um, but the hardest part sometimes is just like sitting down and getting getting started. So if you can take the weight or the pressure off of like what that session is supposed to be and just say like, okay, at this time every day I'm going to sit down, I'm going to start working at like, you know, let's say it's like 7 p.m. after work, I've had dinner, 7 p.m. each evening, going to sit here and make a little bit of music and it might turn into something great and it might not. And that's fine. You can write for the waste basket, as <laughs> some people like to say. Not everything that you make has to be finished or meaningful. I think what's really important is that we develop this practice first. Um, so one of my favorite teachers, uh, who's still now a very uh, dear friend of mine and mentor, um, Steve Nalepa, he used to share this story um, with a lot of the, the Team Supreme <laughs> kids back in the day, um, where, and the, the story that he shared was like, okay, so there's this classroom, uh, it's, a, it's a pottery class, and at the start of this semester, the pottery teacher split the room into two groups, and they said, okay, everyone on this side of the room, your work is going to be judged on volume. So how many like bowls you create um, is how we're gonna determine your grade. So this many bowls gets an A and like a few less than that gets a B and so on and so forth. So everyone here, you're just going for quantity, we're going for volume, that's how you will be graded. And then everyone on this other side of the room, group B, you are gonna be graded on just one bowl but it's gonna be the quality of just that one bowl. So like how, like if you can make just the most perfect bowl ever, you'll get an A and if it has some flaws, B, blah, 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 blah. So the semester goes on. Um, group A over here going for quantity um, is working away all semester, making lots of bowls. A lot of them are kind of crappy, um, but it doesn't matter because they're just going for volume, trying things out, making tons of stuff. Group B is over here, they're like heads in textbooks, like researching, theorizing, designing, like talking with one another, trying to figure out like, okay, how do we make this one like most perfect bowl? Like how do we achieve this? Let's like really figure this out. So they're over here like in theory land. End of the semester comes around. I promise the story is going somewhere. End of the semester comes around and it turns out Group A, the group that was shooting for quantity over quality per se, ended up making also the best quality bowls because they got the most practice time in. Group B that was shooting for quality, like just couldn't pull it off, couldn't get it done. <laughs> okay, so poor Group B, I know, we feel bad. They tried, they tried, they didn't know. Um, they didn't know that was the way. So <laughs> I think, um, what can, again, what can we learn from this as far as like how it applies to music or other mediums? It's okay to not necessarily finish everything that you start. It's okay to make a high volume of things 
And, and then like, you know, if you're making, let's say like a sketch per day or a couple sketches per week, you know, do that for a while, look back on this volume that you have and pick out like your very few favorites, sort of like diamonds of that group that like really excite you and light you up to, to fully finish out. It can take a lot of the pressure off of like your day-to-day -day practice because when you sit down to create, you're not just saying like, all right, here we go. I'm going to make my like magnum opus. Like this is going to be my next single or like, here we go. I'm going to sit down and write my next album. This is it. Like if I told myself that before every session, I would rarely like feel all that motivated to sit down because it's so much pressure that we're putting on ourselves to like perform at a certain level. And it's and what what's really the most valuable thing here is just getting that time in, getting that volume in and showing up every single day. Doesn't matter if like a lot of your ideas never make it off the hard drive. The fact that you showed up and got that practice in that and you sort of like, you know, played your scales, you can look at look at it that way. Um, that time really counts for so much. And then hopefully, you know, the sessions can be even more fun because you have less mental pressure, less like strain um, on uh, on your process. So with that, you know, how do we stay consistent? How do we still reward ourselves as we go along? Um, I always recommend to people that I'm working with that you have some way of just tracking your daily practice. Like I use a little um, journal, I think it's called like the, what is that, the Best Self Co, Best Self Company journal. Um, I'm not in any way affiliated with them. Um, it's just like a, a planner, basically. Um, but they have this nice little section in the front where you can track like your daily habits. And so one of them for me is just music. Did I show up and like make some music today? Or did I play an instrument? Did I, did, did I do something related to my music? And if I did, I can just, you know, check off that little box for the day. And so just having that system of tracking helps to keep me so much more consistent than when I'm not physically tracking this somehow or somehow like rewarding myself for showing up for that session. Um, anyway, uh, you don't even need to get a fancy journal or anything for that. You can just grab a, a piece of paper, or, like pull up a document on your computer or your phone and have some way to just track things um, consistently. So there is that. And yeah, also I'm trying to like pay attention to the chat a little bit in the background if anyone has questions or like experiences where maybe you've tried similar strategies in the past and you want to share them, like please feel free um, to, to drop in questions, experiences, resources. Oh, Notion is a good app. I have to check that out. Um, cool. So again, another... Uh, like practice that I like to do to try to help with this, to help with my motivation and consistency is like also gamify it. So if I sit down for a session and maybe like set a timer, for example, that's going to totally change my energy and my approach when I sit down to do this work. So I love doing, um, I mean, like time-based challenges are like all over the place now. They're really, really popular in like various production, like in artist communities. But just setting a timer for an hour and seeing how much of a track you can execute in that space uh, is really fun. It's really exciting. It's cool to like, you know, sometimes even stream that process or like screen recorded or documented in some way anything to just like make it fun try to take yourself a little bit less seriously <laughs> and gamify the whole process um, can can really help with your energy and and your consistency with all of this as well um, especially like if you're not feeling particularly inspired um, there's like a common saying in, um, I'm trying to remember like where I got this from originally. I'll have to look this up later because I don't want to misquote the person. But um, a, a like mantra that I like to use is mood follows action. So instead of 
waiting for the inspiration to come, like we were talking about before, um, or instead of like waiting until I feel good or waiting for the right conditions to appear before I sit down and start creating, um, I just got to take action first and my mood will then follow, my inspiration or excitement will then follow. It's usually not the other way around for me. Um, I have a greater uh, like chance of changing my mood or of changing my state in any given like session if I just sit down and start doing the work and take some action versus kind of like sitting around and procrastinating and waiting for things to you know, magically line up before I feel like I could possibly sit down to start working or to start practicing. Um, so that can be, um, yeah, really helpful. I'm just catching up on the chat. Oh, nice. You made a beat every day for six months. Um, yeah. So having some sort of daily objective like that or seeing how many consecutive days you can go is can be so helpful. It can be so exciting. Um, yeah. Yes. And yes, not everything needs to be finished. <laughs> totally. It's totally okay for you to not finish every single idea. I don't know. I, it, th I'm sure there are lots of other artists who would perhaps disagree with that. Um, that's just my personal outlook is you don't have to finish everything like any every idea that comes to my mind is not worth finishing honestly every like song that I sit down to start writing is is not worth finishing it's not that great and I think if you talk to um a lot of like you know like songwriters and producers who are um making like top 40s or like billboard hot 100 like type music if you ask any of them you know about their practices so many people that I've interviewed or or read interviews from have said like yeah maybe my like top five percent of ideas end up getting placed maybe maybe even like top two percent so I'm like if these like musical beasts who have like set up their whole lives <laughs> around production and songwriting like if they're only getting like five percent or two percent like, who am I to think that, my, like, mine's going to be any better or any worse? It doesn't, I mean, I guess that kind of comparing is, is perhaps not the healthiest thing, but it's, it's comforting to know that, like, you know, even at, even for someone who's been doing this, let's say, longer than I have, um, if their averages are looking like that, it's okay for me to, like, maybe not finish everything myself <laughs> as well. Um... Yeah. Um, oh, this is a good question. How does your mindset change when you decide you want to release something? That's when it really starts to feel like a grind to me. Um, yes, that is a good question. I'm trying to think if I have anything in my notes that I was going to cover today that could kind of help with that. Because um, the biggest shift I think that occurs for me internally um, is now there's perhaps, like, this other factor of, like, fear, fear factor, um, <laughs> no, then all of a sudden, like, when you decide you're going to finish something, it's like, okay, that means I'm going to, or I should say, when you decide you're going to release something, so now you're preparing it for release, um, there's fear that comes up, um, and it's, it's something that I think is, pretty universal. I have yet to speak with an artist who doesn't have some degree of like fear or some degree of insecurity or self-doubt when they talk about putting their work out or sharing it with a wider group of people. Um, if that doesn't exist for someone, I think that's amazing. But if you look at this from like a perspective of just human evolution, we are born with with the ability to feel fear as a means to keep us safe, right? And if we didn't have this, um, our species would not have survived <laughs> for as long as it has. I mean, fear definitely serves a purpose. Um, if, if, you know, a, a saber-toothed tiger all of a sudden pops out 
at you as you're going about your day. It's totally normal. Um, you're gonna that that's gonna elicit a fear response within you, right? So increased heart rate, um, eyes dilated, heightened senses, um, and it's not a state that is necessarily healthy to stay in long term. Uh, for us physically, but it can help us deal with what's going on in that moment, either f fight, fight, what is it, fight, flight, or freeze, one of these things. <laughs> um, so it, it definitely serves a purpose. And, and then when you look at this from a social setting, like, you know, back in the day, and even now, we need, we have and still do need tribes to survive. So, you know, back in the caveman days, um, if you were a human out there on your own, there's no chance that you would survive for as long as you could if you were with a tribe of people um, all working together to take care of one another, to provide for one another, to protect one another, etc. And if you do something to like socially um, you know, remove yourself from that tribe if you like do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing and like now you're banned from from the homies. Um, <laughs> that, that actually is a life or death situation. And so that's again, I think why we can f still, t why we do still today feel this sense of fear in, in social situations or bringing this back to our, our conversation around music and creativity we feel we can feel this around sharing music you know is putting a track on on spotify um a life or death situation uh i don't think so but it can still <laughs> elicit those same um emotional and physical responses in our bodies okay so knowing all of this what the heck do we do about that how do we still move through it um and sorry, I'm just catching up on the chat again. Like, how do we, st <laughs> RIP to all the canceled cavemen. Um, yeah, and I'm speaking on this, like, so we're, we're talking about fear, but, uh, you know, present, also present in that situation can be a lot of really positive feelings too. I'm not, I don't mean to say that like this is the dominant response anytime we put music out. I'm just saying that can be one factor in all of the things that we're feeling. Joy, um, love, connection, expression. So all of that can coexist at the same time. I'm not saying this is like some traumatic event for every artist who's ever put music out. Um, just wanted to acknowledge it as a thing that can come up. So um, something that has like helped me a lot in the past and I know helped some of the artists that I've worked with as well just to kind of manage this sense of fear. Um, this comes into play also with like stage fright too. So if you're a performer and, and you, you know, are, are feeling a lot of anxiety or something before stepping out on stage, um, these exercises can help with managing that, uh, potentially help with managing that as well. Um, so. I should actually, uh, I wish I had this interview pulled up. So there's this uh, really amazing firefighter. Her name is Caroline Paul. Um, she has a book out. I, I can't remember if she has two books out or one. Um, I'll have to find this info and like share it with you all later on Discord or something so that I don't get too derailed in this conversation. Um, but she talks about courage so she's a firefighter right and um you know does things on a regular basis that most of us would deem potentially scary like running into a burning building to save people um so she talks about courage as something that we can practice or it's something it's like a muscle that we can actually consciously work on building up for ourselves and we can do this by practicing like these smaller acts of micro bravery quote unquote um which i as a concept just really enjoy so she talks about like you know just on a daily basis like what's one thing that you could do per day to get a little bit outside of your comfort zone or or um practice just being slightly courageous on some very, very small scale. So 
you know, definitely don't like put yourself in <laughs> harm's way intentionally or anything like that. But I think a few of the examples she gives are like, um, you know, could you, or I can't remember if this is from her or someone, from someone else. I will get these resources cited properly and post them on Discord for you because I do want to share more information for those who are curious about going more in depth on some of this stuff. Um, but for example, you could, let's say you, you have like some fear of rejection as most of us do on some level um, to kind of practice the opposite of that, you could go into, let's say, like your usual coffee shop or something, uh, a place of business that you frequent regularly. Um, and when you're ordering your coffee, just um, ask for like a 10% discount. Um, just, <laughs> just ask for a discount the next time you buy something. And, you know, chances are like the barista or whoever might look at you and be like, uh, why, or they, they might say no, they probably will say no, um, but that's fine, because you can practice <laughs> like asking anyways, despite being afraid of getting some sort of rejection on some, some level, even though it's like obviously not a big deal, it's a very low stakes practice, um, but you can move through that and feel that it is possible for yourself to still easily move through these situations and take action um, without letting it affect too much of like your decision making. Um, so that's a really fun one to try out as kind of like a creative cross training exercise. Um, another one that I really like uh, is you can like go into, you know, maybe a public place uh, safely somewhere. Um, let's say like you're in a, a park or like a, a mall. I don't know if people still go to like shopping malls. Um, somewhere where there's like some people around doing their thing and just go like lay down on on the sidewalk <laughs> or in the mall for like 30 seconds just like lay there and <laughs> see what happens um people might like ask if you're okay and you can just be like yeah i know i'm good i'm just you know having a rest you're not allowed to tell them that it's like part of an experiment um but just just experience that like fear of judgment <laughs> from other people for a second. Again, on this very like, in this very low stakes way, um, and and see what happens. And I found that like when I do these things, it, it in like kind of practice these smaller acts of like courage or micro bravery on a, on a consistent level. It really does eventually kind of seep into my creative process and also my ability to to finish things you know for release as as you know we were talking about earlier even more i think quickly and efficiently because i know now from experience not just you know on an intellectual level but i know having experienced it I am able to move through these emotions and not let them affect as much of my decision making creatively. I know that I can take more risks and um, yeah, not just cripple under the fear of judgment or rejection, et cetera. Um, so yeah, anyway, just trying to catch up again on the chat. Um, yeah, so those, again, I'm just throwing a bunch of practices out here for, for y'all to, to try. Um, some of it might resonate, some of it might not, so, so make of it what you will. Um, kind of bouncing around in my notes here, I'm trying to see what else I could share with you all that is relevant for this series. Oh, here's a good one. Um, I... Let's see. Oh, we could, yeah, I feel like I'm running out of time because I could just talk for hours about a lot of this stuff. Um, but uh, I think to kind of wrap things up, we'll, we might go into one other exercise after this. We'll see how we're doing on time. Um, but one other major um, sort of area that I work on with artists and, and just do for myself is is really consciously studying 
my influences, musical influences and otherwise, um, and digging into who they were in- influenced by and who they are inspired by, um, and doing some research to really better understand musical history. And I know there, there might be other artists who, who are also watching this stream too who aren't working in music specifically, so this can definitely apply to visual art, to all sorts of other mediums that we have. Um, but it's something that I think can commonly get overlooked uh, in our in our striving to be like original and forward thinking and like push music forward and like create the future of sound and like do all of these really cool things. Uh, I think to do so in a meaningful way requires that we have a solid knowledge and foundation of our history and can go back not just to the previous generation, but generations prior. So one exercise that um, I've done for myself and again, asked like a lot of my artists that I work with to, to try is putting together, um, starting with like a list of, let's say like your top five current influences right now musically. Um, they could be t- hypothetically from like any point in time, doesn't matter if they're contemporary or not. Um, just write down like five artists or, or creators, composers, whoever, um, who really inspire you or who influence you. And of those five, do a little bit of deep diving on Google or wherever, or go to a, a library, what a concept, um, <laughs> and figure out who their top influences are or who they studied from um, or where they got a lot of their knowledge or their inspiration and write those down and from there you can kind of start to work backwards and create this sort of like musical family tree if you will um, that is you know very much connected with the music that you are most interested in. I think um, one of the sort of more off-putting factors of of studying music history is that there's so much out there, especially like when you look outside of Western music, uh, you know, amongst all musical traditions across the world, there's just this vast, vast, vast history, and it's amazing, but it sometimes is a little bit intimidating to figure out, like, uh, what a good starting point would be, or, you know, maybe just pulling up some, like, classical music textbooks isn't the most inspiring thing, or somehow doesn't feel the most relevant, until you can directly connect, like, some sort of um, path of artists between you and these composers from generations before, or musicians from generations before. Um, So putting together some sort of like personal musical family tree for yourself, I think can be a really fun exercise and it just better informs you, um, you know, knowing where you come from, you're gonna have a much better, what am I trying to say? Slow down, Kate. (laughs) You're gonna be much better equipped to push this medium forward in a a meaningful way, I believe. Um, And to, again, um, take this one step further too, um, with everyone that I work with, I'm always harping on about the importance of doing transcription exercises. Um, If you're someone who has maybe come from like a a more traditional music school or especially this is common um, for anyone who's like studied jazz uh, with a a, a more formal quote unquote setting, um, you might be sick of doing stuff like this, but transcribing music that you like. So hearing a piece of music, again, it could be from any, could be something contemporary, it could be something from history, but listening to it and then transcribing it, either writing it down in like musical notation if that's relevant to you, um, but most importantly, like trying to recreate it in whatever DAW you're working in as closely as possible will teach you so much 
so much. You can learn so much from this process. It's it can be tedious. It's maybe not the most like exciting or glamorous thing to do sometimes because it's like, oh well, I'm just gonna copy this music and then like, what do I do with this? You know, like this isn't me. It's not original. I can't necessarily maybe release this if it's an exact copy. I guess I could put it out as a cover song, but like, you know, how is this gonna build me up as an artist and build up my catalog? But Honestly, if you take the time to to do this, even if it's for like a very small section of a song, like make this a weekly practice. Like every Sunday you're gonna pick a song and you're gonna transcribe like one section of it as closely and accurately as you can in your DAW. Um, that will teach you so much about how things are constructed, about anything even if you're trying to like reverse engineer some of the sound design might not turn out perfectly but you will learn so much from this process and from this experience and it's going to enhance your vocabulary so much so that way when you sit down to create your own work um, again you're speaking with this larger vocabulary like anytime you know it, it's funny like for for example, if we have a goal to like write a book, let's say, we don't just sit down and start trying to write that book before we study the language that we are writing it in, right? We need to learn to read first. We need to learn how sentences and paragraphs are structured um, before we can really get the best out of our writing skills. But I see especially like with, with um, people who are maybe new to production, it's like, okay, we're going to skip over learning all this music theory hullabaloo. And, <laughs> and like, I sound like a grandma sometimes, sorry. But it's like, okay, let's just like cut through all that and like go straight to like making stuff in this DAW and like see what happens. And it's like, okay, yes, that's very fun. And that is so valuable. And I like, I, think you should absolutely spend time doing that. Yes, 1000%. And it can be so valuable if you take a little bit of your time every week just on focused study of music itself and not just writing. Um, so again, if you're choosing songs for these transcription exercises that are relevant to you, if you're choosing music that you're really inspired by and you want to better understand, I think it's going to make this practice a lot more engaging and a lot more relevant than, you know, maybe picking up a music theory textbook off the shelf and, and trying to, you know, get into whatever's in front of you. Um, if the, depending on how the information is presented, maybe that is interesting to you. Like, I personally enjoy that sometimes as well. But trying to make this like as directly meaningful to like each person as possible um, so that it's not just, yeah, you're not just going off of what one person who wrote the textbook said <laughs> is important. Um, all right, I should pause and catch up on the chat for a second. Um, Yes, even if your like attempt is absolutely horrible, I believe you can learn so much from from that process. Because I mean, what you're essentially doing is you're taking you're taking a piece of music, you're taking an idea, you're hearing it, and then your task is to get it out into this other medium. In this case, you know, it's you're getting it out onto the computer into the DAW. Right. That's like in its simplest terms, like that's what happened. That's what's happening when you're transcribing something. So when you get to a point where you've got a really cool song idea in your head, that's something that is original to you. Your skills and your ability to hear clearly what's in your head and then get that out into the DAW, onto the computer or wherever is is going to be so much stronger. You're going to be able to work more quickly. Um, it's good for so many things. I'm just having like a random mind blank out. <laughs> but yeah, what I'm trying to say is like that can develop so many skills simultaneously um, and take a little bit of the stress or pressure off of like, okay, I'm not only like producing and, and, 
and sound designing and sampling and doing all these things, but I'm also having to like write the song at the same time. It's like, no, okay, the writing's already taken care of. We know what we have to execute. So now our task is just to execute it as best we can. And I think like taking focused time to really practice that can um, just help you in so many ways <laughs> as a creator. And again, I'm speaking on this from just the perspective of, of music production, but um, this works for other mediums as well. You know, if you're a visual artist, um, taking a reference photo or a reference piece of work from another artist and, and trying to like copy that as precisely as possible, just as an exercise can teach you so much and can just like better equip you skill wise so that when you're working on your own stuff, hopefully, hopefully things are, are coming out even more quickly and easily and, and you've, you're enjoying it even more because you're not sitting there kind of banging your head against the wall, figure, like trying to figure out like, oh, what is this exact chord progression that's kind of in my head? I don't quite understand how these are constructed or what, is, what does this beat look like in MIDI or on the timeline? Like making those brain associations, I think is, is really, really helpful. So, um, yes, yes. I'm rambling a lot today. We haven't even opened Ableton, which is wild. Um, but I just wanted to take a few minutes here at the end of the stream for uh, questions from anyone. If you're watching live and have something that you wanted to ask and or share, um, I would love to try to help as best I can. Um, yeah. I'll give it a minute. How how is uh, how is this series going for everyone so far? Um, are you happy with the music you've been working on? Like, how are things feeling? I would love to know how it's going for you. Oh, it's so weird seeing the delayed video of myself on Twitch. Nice. Happy but scared because one is always biased. That's very, very deep, very poetic. You've been working on everything except your project, classic. I am always so guilty of this. <laughs> I will work on everyone else's stuff and like, you know, just deep clean my apartment <laughs> and do all sorts of random tasks before I actually sit down to work on my own music. It's so silly. Um, your track idea is awesome, just having a bit of trouble writing the verses. Nice. Chorus is awesome though. Awesome. That's good to hear. Yeah, verses can be tricky. Um, when in doubt, do some transcription exercises. <laughs> See what comes from that. Um, Love it. Or yeah, when in doubt, collaborate. If there's something you're struggling with, reach out to someone who excels at that thing. Love it. Cool. Well, I am going to uh, wrap this up. Um, there's, oh, there's just so many things that I could still keep talking about, but it's hard to just sit and listen to one person ramble for, for this long. So to spare you all, I will, I will wrap up this stream, but just wanted to say thank you so much again for tuning in. Thank you, Bitbird, for existing, um, for putting this whole series together, for bringing so many amazing creatives together. It's just so magical to be a part of this. Um, sending so much love to you all. Again, my name is Dot. I will put up a screen in a bit that has um, some info on where to find me on socials, uh, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. Um, I've got some new music out. I put out a, a new song uh, with Bitbird. I guess it's not that new. It's like it came out last year now. Crazy how time flies. <laughs> um, but yeah, I put out some music um, last year with my friend, Goodnight Cody. Um, so that is up on um, the Bitbird GF4 compilation if you want to check out some of my music. Uh, yeah, 
Sending you all lots of love. I hope you have an amazing week. Thank you so much for hanging out. Stay creative. Take care of yourselves. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Just do a little bit every day. Um, yeah, that's all. <laughs> all right. Peace out. Tell me that you want me, that you feel the same way.